So today we're in part three of this message series on uh, standing and winning because the battle is real. We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now. The battle is for real. It's waging all around us all the time. And like it or not, know it or not, you are in the middle of it. There are real casualties in this real warfare that is going on, and we're all part of it. And so we are fighting this fight, and we only win when we are in the authority of and speaking the name of Jesus Christ. We win because he won. We win because the fight has already been concluded, yet it continues. You ever think about that? Why do we say that the fight's over, the war has been won, but the battles still continue? You ever think about that? We're going to deal with that here in a couple of weeks. I'm going to look into Scripture and see why we say it's over, but yet it's not over. So I hope you'll stick with me as we continue through this series over the next several weeks. Weeks. We've been talking about how we battle and we win in his name. And this is not that kind of battle. It's a different kind of battle. That's what we've been talking about uh, this whole series so far. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, we're told that though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. It's not that kind of war. It's a different kind of war. We're waging war differently than you are used to thinking about. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't a physical war just be a little easier? I mean, wouldn't it just be easier uh, because in a physical war, you can see what's going on, you know what's happening, you experience the results. I mean, think about it. Two Tuesdays ago, nobody had to tell the Ukrainians that they were under missile attack from Russia, right? Two Tuesdays ago, Russia launched its most intense missile barrage into Ukraine so far of the war. 96 or 98 missiles landed in Ukraine from Russia on Tuesday, two Tuesdays ago, and nobody had to be like, oh, hey, by the way, if you didn't know, you're under attack from Russia. It, it wasn't a surprise to anyone because the air raid sirens all went off. People rushed for cover. They went underground and into buildings. The missiles began to land. Explosions were heard. Damage was all over the place. There was loss. There were casualties. It was a for real thing that they experienced physically, and nobody was shocked to find out later, oh, we just had an attack. I think, I think sometimes that a physical war would just be easier, but the scripture is clear we're not waging war according to the flesh. It's not that kind of war. It's a different kind of war. This war, this battle requires a different mindset. It requires a different posture. It requires a different approach. It requires different weapons. It's a whole different thing, and you've got to be ready. You've got to be equipped. You've got to be prepared to be fighting this fight because, because this fight sometimes is a lot more subtle. I mean, sometimes you don't, I mean, you don't hear loud explosions in this fight, right? You don't hear screams of anguish and pain all the time in this fight. This is a different kind of fight. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's quiet. It starts and is conducted differently. You see, here's the thing. Satan doesn't invade your life with tanks and missiles and soldiers. Satan instead invades your mind. He starts right here. He starts by planting seeds in your head and the battle begins right here. Okay, I just want to tell you, that's why the scripture says, prepare your minds for action. 
Be ready because your enemy is on the prowl. It starts right here, and most of us have not prepared for battle. For some reason, we think we're just going to float along and hope that everything's okay, and once it happens, then I'll, you know, kind of be ready for it. But the reality is, it's already happening. The reality is for so many of us, we have not prepared our minds and we're already losing and we don't even know it. Remember, this is not obvious, it's subtle because, and this is the first blank on your page, remember, warfare begins with accusation. Warfare begins with accusation. It starts accuser telling his lies. He's always been a liar. He's always been an accuser. And that's always been his tactic. And it is with you today. Jesus said in John 8, 44, when he lies, it's consistent with his character because he's a liar and the father of lies. He starts by toying with your mind, by asking Questions by planting seeds of doubt in your head that grow. In fact, it says in 2 Corinthians 10, it says that in this different kind of war, not the same kind of war, different kind of war, we have weapons. And our weapons in this warfare are not of the flesh because it's not that kind of war, right? They're not of the flesh, but our weapons in this war have divine power to destroy Strongholds, divine power to destroy strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? It's a, it's a fortress. It's a, it's a structure. In, in this kind of war, it's a structure, right, where you, you build uh, the fortress and the enemy can take up residence, even in the other uh, party's territory. And so they take up residence inside, and their goal is to, to put as many of their soldiers inside this stronghold as they can. So this passage is talking about our spiritual war, and uh, in our weapons have divine power to destroy strongholds. What is a spiritual stronghold? If you read the passage on, we're going to do that in a minute, you'll see that a stronghold is a mental stronghold. In fact, next blank on your page, a stronghold is a bad thought habit. It's a mental block. It's a pattern or a way of thinking that sets up camp inside your mind and it traps you in a constant cycle of defeat, right? It's a bad thought habit. Right? You, you know what this is like. You, you've seen it. You're convinced. You're convinced that you'll never find love. You know, you're convinced that you have nothing to contribute. You're convinced that there's never going to be enough in your life. You're convinced that all you ever do is lose. Right? So you can have that mental thought pattern that keeps you trapped that way. It can be this thought pattern. It can be a worldview. You can be trapped in a worldview that informs you wrongly about the way you think in the first place. So you may have an atheistic worldview, an anti-God worldview. You may even be confused on your worldviews and be, uh, you know, not sure where you stand. So I've got a friend who's got a friend who's a Christian, they're a Christian, all right? So they believe in the Bible, they believe in God, they believe in Jesus. My friend says this person has a good theological background, yet they also believe that every woman should have whatever choice of what to do in their pregnancy. And they view that as a choice issue, not a life issue. And so they're standing on rocky ground shifting sands it can be a personal attitude you know your 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 thought pattern can be a personal attitude you know what it's like when someone's always seeking approval look at me look look how good i tell me how good i am tell me i'm worthy right or they may have personal idols in their lives things they just can't let go of or maybe, maybe they're trapped 
in a pattern of fear, guilt, resentment, insecurity. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? We all, we all deal with strongholds to one degree or another. Everybody in the room and everybody watching online, they deal, I deal with strongholds of one kind. Some are huge strongholds. Some are still small strongholds. Some of us don't even know when we've got a stronghold in our life and we just live with it. It just perpetuates in our life. I, I know a mom who has a full-grown married daughter. And this mom is trapped in a stronghold because I've watched over the course of a long time how this daughter and this mom, they can't seem to get along. Nobody's ever picking a fight with each other, but mom has such a stronghold of negativity in her life, in her mind, that her answer to everything is no. So I watch the daughter. She says, I'm gonna go to this college. Mom says, you'll never get in there. I I'm gonna become this profession. Oh, you'll, you'll never make it with that. Good news, mom, I'm getting married. Well, that, that's never gonna last. We're gonna add this addition onto the home. <laughs> You can't afford that. Every single response that she has to her daughter is a negative response. She has a stronghold. And look, it's not just ruining her life, but what is it doing to her daughter? Who, spoiler alert, wants almost nothing to do with her mom anymore. Strongholds are destructive, and we all deal with it to one degree or another, it's probably why you're fighting in your marriage. It's probably why you haven't reached goals in your life. It's why you struggle for approval. It's why you find yourself alone. What kinds of bad thought patterns have set up camp in your head and are gradually eating away at the victory that your father has designed for you to live in? Satan knows that we have this great weakness right between our ears. He knows that we're broken by sin and we, he knows that we are susceptible to his attacks right here and so that's his strategy that's where he starts he doesn't come with missiles and tanks he comes with questions doubt and fear right and he speaks and corrupts us Jeremiah 17 says the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Satan knows that we are weak in this area, and so he exploits our weakness. Men, he gets us really, really well. In fact, I would wager that Satan has strongholds, men, in your lives that you're really not even aware of right now. And I'm not going to talk about the obvious ones, you know, the pornography or the, uh, the materialism. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the irresponsibility towards your spiritual life and your family's spirit. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about some, uh, I'm just going to talk about one, you know, maybe one that you don't realize is in your life, a stronghold that Satan may have built. So I'm going to ask some questions and I'm going to see how you do. Men, I'm talking to men. Uh, do we have any men in the room? Okay, we have a few. Good. All right, good. So I'm talking to men. First question. There's a runoff election coming up in another week or two. And have you seen the recent polling data? It seems like everybody's already decided one particular way to vote. And you're thinking, how can so many people be so stupid? I'm the one that's got it figured out. Why can't they just do what I'm doing? Hello? Hmm. Okay, let me ask a second, a second question. On the way to church this morning, you shared the road with countless other drivers, all idiots, <laughs> right? And 
in Gilmer County, let me just, let me take a survey. In Gilmer County, who is the best driver in the whole county? Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. <laughs> Everybody else an idiot except for me. Okay, one more. After Thanksgiving weekend, men, who is the only normal person in your family? Uh -huh, that's right, that's right. Everybody else crazy, right? So is it possible? Hey, men, there's just three simple questions. Is it possible that Satan has already set up a stronghold of pride and arrogance in our lives? He's at work. The battle is real, and you're already in the middle of it, and you're getting defeated and don't even know it. And that's not even the obvious ones. So let's go on this passage we're looking at in 2 Corinthians 10. It says, again, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We've established that we all have strongholds and we've got to get rid of them. If we're going to stand, we've got to get rid of the strongholds. So our weapons can destroy those. He goes on, Paul says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. When we talk about making sure that we're standing and winning, we usually tend to think of actions. I want to make sure I know what action to take. But right here, Paul is saying you can't start with actions. It doesn't start. It's not that kind of war. He says, we have to start here. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. The Greek word here for captive, it means to control, to conquer, to bring into submission. It means men, it means women, that we have to learn to control the way we think. We have to learn to bring our thoughts into submission because if you aren't going to control them, Satan sure will. So we've got to bring them under control. We've got to take them captive for Christ. The problem is, how in the heck do I do that? How, how in the heck do I do that? How, how do I, because I, you know, I'm the pastor and I've, I've got disciplines in my life that I've kind of instituted specifically for my mind. I've got some time that I set aside and I do nothing but study. I, I read, I, I pray, and I write. I've got these times every week. I've got these times where I, I do this for certain time allotments at certain times. And I'm just, you know, I, I'm trying to just be in God's word. I'm trying to be sensitive to him. I'm trying to let the spirit, the Holy Spirit speak to me. I just, I want to not have any other distractions. But dude, I'm here to tell you that things pop into my mind. Things pop. I mean, things just, boom, I'm starting to think. I, especially ever since, especially ever since the advent of the, the digital rectangle in my pocket. Do you have this? I mean, I feel like I'm, I need to check my, I need to check my mail. Do I, did I get any email? I need, to, I need to check my messages. I feel like somebody needs to, I better just check up and see where my wife is right now. Or, or, or I didn't check my feed. You know, I need that dopamine hit and I better scroll once or twice to kind of get that hit. And you know how it goes. I'm just going to, I'm just going to check. And I'm just going to check a little bit. I'm just going to look for a second. And, can, and before you know it, it's been an hour. How do I, how do I control my mind, how do I make my mind mind? How do I do that? How do I take every thought captive? Long before the social media age, the apostle Paul wrestled with this very question himself. He was like us in this. In fact, in Romans 7, he says this. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. I have this natural inclination to bad. 
I want to be good, but I have this natural inclination to, to bad. And he, he, here's how he describes it. He says, I want, I, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I, I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. This is the Apostle Paul, Saint Paul, the guy who met Jesus face to face on the road to Damascus, he was blinded by the presence of Jesus, knocked him down off of his horse, and he devoted the rest of his life to proclaiming the gospel. He became a lifelong permanent missionary, planting churches all over the place, getting beat for it, and he still struggled with this, want to do what's right, but can't. Want to do what's good, but don't. Don't want to do wrong, but I do it anyway. And he wraps up this thought by saying this, oh, what a miserable person I am. I suck. I, I'm terrible at this. I know who I'm supposed to be, but I just can't bring myself to be who I'm supposed to be. He realized who he was in his natural self. He realized the thing that I hope you and I realize about ourselves, that we have a, nat a, a natural inclination to bad because all of us are born into sin in our lives, right? Right? Uh, Bibles, let's, Bi Bible 101, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If anyone says he's without sin, he's lying to himself. That's what the Bible says. All of us are born in sin. God says to you and to me, he says, you are to be holy, holy as I am holy. In other words, your goodness ought to measure up to my goodness. And the scripture is clear. Anything that falls short of that mark is sin, right? Anything that falls short of that mark is incompatible with God. It's like trying to plug your old 1987 VCR into an HDMI port on the back of your big screen TV. It's incompatible. It doesn't work that way, right? So any falling short means that we are incompatible. Any falling short means that we are at odds with God. It means that we become an enemy of God. It means that we are in the war, but we're on the wrong side. And in this war, who wins? God alone wins. Nobody wins against God. All his enemies will be defeated. And Paul's feeling that. He's feeling that. He, he's feeling the defeat that's not just gonna happen in his life, but it is happening now. His sin nature speaks loudly in his life like it does for me and you because Satan plants those thoughts and builds those strongholds. So let's go back to it. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. What a miserable person I am. And then he, he's realizing that he can't, right? I wanna do what's right, but I can't. I wanna do what's right, I don't. I don't wanna do wrong, but I do it anyway. Three times he's saying, I can't do this myself. I'm a miserable person. But the next question he asks is the right question. He says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I can't do it on my own. I don't have it in me. I am a sinful person inclined to bad. So who will free me from this life dominated by sin and death? And he answers his own question. He says, thank God. The answer is in the name that is above every name. The name at which every eye will see, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Can I get an amen from anybody in the room? Good grief. 
So he says the answer is in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he came and went to the cross for us and all of God's anger at our sin, at our falling short of his mark, all of God's anger, all of God's wrath poured out onto Jesus on the cross and he took the blame for my sin. He took my punishment in my place. He died for me there. He went to the grave, and because he paid that debt in full, he rose again three days later. And now, John's gospel says, all who believed in him, to him he gives the right to become a child of God. That's what he does for me. He is the one that rescues me from this life that's dominated by sin. John, John the apostle, banished to the island of Patmos, finds himself standing in the presence of the glorified Jesus. Not just the, not just the resurrected Jesus, you know, wearing a you know, linen robe and flip-flops. He's in the presence of the glorified Jesus. The way he appears today in heaven. And Jesus... <laughs> After, after John, by the way, is really addled and Jesus has to be like, okay, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. Jesus, Jesus says, I want you to, John, I want you to write a letter to one of my churches, the church in Ephesus. They're a good church. I love this church, they're a good church. But the problem with the church at Ephesus, by this time, they had fallen away from their first love. They, they didn't love God and love others as much as they used to. Satan had spoken enough, built enough strongholds to where they were kind of spiritually feeling a little dead. They weren't who they were supposed to be. And here's what Jesus tells John to write in Revelation 2, 5. He says, look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Come back, come back. I know, I know Satan has built a stronghold in your mind. I know that you've become a slave to the negativity or the slave to the, the substances or the slave to the addiction of some kind. It starts with repentance. Remember, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. It's a turning from one thing and turning to something else. He says, come back to me. Repent from your sin. You're falling short come back to me and let's rebuild this. Let's start over again. This battle is happening and you need to win it right here. So how do we do that? How do we repent? Is it just like, oh, I'm sorry, God, you're right, I'm wrong? Yes, that's where it begins. But like last week, I wanna give you three specific ways that I think you can practice ongoing repentance in your life so that you can experience him and the elimination of strongholds in your life, okay? Um, first of all, though, 2 Corinthians 7 says, the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. He wants us to experience fully our salvation from being a slave to the strongholds of Satan. So how do we do that? Let me give you three ways to do that. Number one, listen, don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you think. Hello? I mean, just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. You know, as I'm doing whatever I'm doing, I got thoughts that pop into my head all the time, sometimes about me, sometimes about you. Sometimes about my wife or my kids. Sometimes about a circumstance or a situation. And just because I think that whatever I'm thinking is the right thing, it doesn't mean it's the right thing. Check everything in your mind against Scripture. Because I know, I, know, I know there's a lot of folks, a lot of folks, including myself, that sometimes we think that we are following Christ's plan for our lives, but we're really following our heart. The deceiving one feels good, seems to be logical, 
but don't believe everything that you think. There's a great prayer in the Psalms that I try to pray frequently. I would encourage you to pray this prayer yourself. Psalm 139, it's beautiful. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That's pretty good. If I'm you right now, I'm jotting down Psalm 120, sorry, Psalm 139, uh, 23 through 24. It's a great prayer to be praying when you're thinking the wrong things. I got one little small example. This is just a small example of how we think the wrong thing, don't believe what you think. So Christmas is coming up in just a few weeks, and one of the things that we do here is that we have a Christmas Eve service. And uh, you might have gotten one of these cards. In fact, it should have been on your chair when you came in. Did you get one of these cards? Yeah? Uh, okay, so here's the deal. Um, we want you to have this because I know, I know that the way we think sometimes, we think that I got friends, I got neighbors, I got coworkers who desperately need to know Jesus but my job is just to keep my head down and my tail tucked and not tell them about Jesus because I might tick them off, you know? I might scare them away from Jesus. I mean, do you see the logical fallacy here? If you don't tell them about Jesus, who will? You want them, you probably prayed for them. I'm sure you've prayed for them. You want them to come to know Christ, but you won't tell them. So here's what we do. We, we do a beautiful Christmas Eve service with all the lights and we sing all of everybody's favorite Christmas songs and, and we do it all in about 45 minutes. It's really cool. Um, and I promise, my promise to you is that, that when you come to Christmas Eve service at four o'clock and six o'clock, um, you'll hear the gospel. You'll hear how much God loves you and how much Jesus sacrificed for you. I promise you'll hear that. So we gave you this but it's not for you. We, we gave it to you as a tool to use. My hope is that every single one of these ends up in that neighbor's hand, that coworker's hand, that person that lives down the road, that relative. My hope is that every single, we bought a thousand of these. And my hope is that every single one of them ends up with you handing it off saying, why don't you come with me to this Christmas Eve service? It's gonna be awesome. I'm coming to the early one and, and maybe we can just kind of come and hang out there together. That's what this is for, and this will help break the stronghold in your mind of you have nothing to contribute, you can't win them to Christ, they're, they're hopeless, they'll never come to Christ. Maybe, maybe, maybe God will use this to turn the light on in somebody's life this year. How about that? Okay, silence from a sleepy, sleepy crowd. First thing in repentance is don't believe everything you think. Second thing is guard your mind from garbage. You know that old 70s computer saying, garbage in, garbage. Garbage in, garbage. All right, good. Four of you are awake. What am I doing wrong? Guard your mind from garbage. What you put in is what comes out. You are what you eat, right? So if you're feeding on the porn, right? If you're feeding on the negativity, if you're feeding, I, mean, I just, listen, I, there's, there's TV shows and stuff I just can't watch. I just can't watch. If nothing else, because of the language, because I've learned that when I watch TV shows with a lot of language, guess what comes out of my mouth? So I have to, I have to guard my mind. So I might really love the TV show, but I, I, that's not for me because that lets Satan win in my life. So I guard my mind from garbage. In Colossians 3, 2, it's not just enough to stay away from stuff, but Colossians 3 says, think about things in heaven, not the things of earth. In Philippians 4, it says, now, brothers and sisters, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are 
excellent and worthy of praise. How would, how would a steady diet of right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and worthy of praise, how would that diet change the stronghold of negativity in your life? How would that diet change the stronghold of fear in your life? What, what would happen if you actually fed on this instead of feeding on the diet that the world has to slop at you. The best defense is simply a good offense. And Christians, we gotta go on the offense. We gotta stop just kinda mm, turning stuff off and we gotta start turning on the things that will build our readiness, our battle readiness. So the first thing is to not believe everything you think. Second thing, guard your mind from garbage. Third thing, keep learning. Keep learning. John Maxwell says leaders are learners. Psalm 25, the psalmist says, lead me by your truth and teach me for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Lead me by truth. I want to be come closer to you. Lead me by your truth. I come to know you better when you teach me. Listen, I know, I know. I'm talking to the men again in the room. I know you got done with school at one point and you swore you'd never pick up a book again as long as you live. I know, I know. I understand. Uh, sometimes I feel the same way. But God has given us a beautiful, wonderful thing called Audible now. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's fantastic. It is fantastic. Uh, I, have, I have the entire Bible in several different formats. Uh, on audio, like you can download the YouVersion Bible app and it will read any translation of the Bible to you anytime you want. You just pick a, a, a book and a chapter and boom, it'll start talking. But not only that, with my Audible, I, I pay for the Audible subscription because I build credits up. I get free books all the time. I get free books all the time. And so whenever I'm walking dogs or driving, uh, whenever I've got downtime, you better believe I'm listening and I'm learning. I, I have my reading time, but I also have my listening time. Right now, right now, I'm listening to a, a Christian book about leadership that's probably going to change the way we do a lot of stuff on our church staff next year. I'm learning and I'm becoming stronger mentally. Even though I'm an old guy, I still have a lot to learn. Am I right, David Lynn? Yes, Steve, you have a lot to learn. Jesus says, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You want to be free? Know his teachings. Learn his teachings. Write this verse down. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew, you watch The Chosen. You ever watch The Chosen? Man, it's a great show. I really, boy, do I recommend that show. They really, I love the way Matthew is portrayed in The Chosen. Uh, what an interesting and deep character he really is. Um, but Matthew was very meticulous to record more of the teachings of Jesus than any of the other gospel writers. So Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you find the Sermon on the Mount which includes the Beatitudes at the very beginning. And boy, if you just want to know the teachings of Jesus to be set free, I recommend you read. Just take some time between now and Christmas. Just read a little bit each day, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You can read three chapters. It'll take you about 15 minutes to read the three chapters. I really encourage you to do that and learn the teachings of Jesus. The truth will set you free. Because men and women, we're soldiers in this fight. And we've got to, we've got to prepare up here. Most of us get defeated before the action takes place because we get defeated right here first. One of our favorite verses is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm just going to look at verse 2, which says, Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by 
changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Listen, men, we've talked about you several times in here. I'm talking about myself. We love to be caught up in our old, worldly, selfish thought patterns. But let God change the way that you think. Repent of your old thought patterns. Expel the strongholds from your life. Learn his truths and Mr. Gorbachev, last blank on the page, tear down your stronghold. Tear down this stronghold. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much that you give us the power to tear down.